Good afternoon, everyone. We're just going to take a couple of moments to wait till uh, attendees stream in, and then we'll get started. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Crystal Mori, and I'm the senior curator at the Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery. I'm coming to you all from my home in Cambridge, Ontario, which is located on block two of the Haldeman Track. This is the traditional territory of the Ottawandaran, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee. And this is land uh, that was gifted to the Six Nations for their role in the American Revolutionary War and the loss of their traditional lands um, elsewhere. In 1796, Six Nations agreed to share approximately 303,000 acres, uh, which includes Block Two, with settlers on the condition that for 999 years, the revenue derived from these lands would be dedicated for Six Nations perpetual care and maintenance. Today, I ask you all to imagine the scope of that neglected promise and to consider what perpetual care truly means. I want to express gratitude for the opportunity to be a guest here and recognize that I share a responsibility in learning its history and seeking new ways to do uh, the work that I do uh, with care. I encourage folks joining us today to seek out Indigenous-led organizations and collectives in the communities where you are located, and to learn more about forms of equity sought locally. For folks in the Waterloo region, I would suggest uh, landback.com as a great place to start your work. Over to you, Deanna. Hi, Crystal, and everyone out there, thank you so much for coming out today to hear our talk. Uh, I too am very thankful to be a part of this celebration of uh, Dr. Sarah Lewis Lewis's work. Um, I'm speaking to you from Montreal, Jojage, uh, traditional territory of the Ginectahaga people. Um, and I um, just moved here and normally I would be giving a land, acknowledge land acknowledgement from Toronto, but yes, I'm here in Montreal uh, and welcome. So uh, I, thank you, Deanna. <laughs> I am honored to be hosting today's conversation with the inimitable uh, Deanna Bowen, organized by MKG127 as a component of the Tribute to Vision and Justice Project and its founder, uh, the scholar Sarah Elizabeth Lewis. Today's conversation is one of many public programs conceived in response to the following prompt. How are the arts responsible for disrupting complicating or shifting narratives of visual representation in the public realm. The intersection of race and citizenship and the development of educational tools to navigate such terrain is not only central to the Vision and Justice Project, but an ongoing concern in Deanna Bowen's practice. On behalf of Deanna and I, I'd like to extend special thanks to Michael Klein, founder and director of NKG 127 and Freeze New York, for the invitation to participate in this landmark program. I'm humbled as always to be sharing virtual space with Deanna. Uh, we, we share space often like on online, on the phone <laughs> and occasionally virtually in public. Um, and Deanna is an artist whose archival inclinations and multifaceted practice has yielded some of the most critical interrogations of empire that we've seen in contemporary Canadian art. Uh, Deanna is based in Montreal, as she said earlier, and makes use of a repertoire of artistic gest gestures that define the Black body and trace its presence and movement in place and time. In recent years, Deanna's work has involved a rigorous examination of her family lineage and their connections to the Black Prairie pioneers of Alberta and Saskatchewan, the Creek Negroes, and all Black towns of Oklahoma the extended Kentucky-Kansas exodus migrations, and the Ku Klux Klan. 
The artistic products of this research have been presented at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, the Art Museum at the University of Toronto, the Institute of Contemporary Art at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and elsewhere. Her works and interventionist practice have garnered significant critical regard internationally. She's received several awards in support of her artistic practice, including a Canada Council New Chapter grant, Ontario Arts Council Media grants, John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship. Uh, Deanna, you're not leaving awards for anyone else. And, <laughs> and you know, I think perhaps, uh, you know, one of the um, achievements or honors that, uh, that's, that, you know, we think about a lot right now, and, you know, I think means quite a bit in light of our conversation is, um, is being one of the eight Governor General's award winners in visual media arts which is an annual award for outstanding contributions to Canadian creativity. Deanna's uh, texts have been published in numerous uh, periodicals and, um, and books. And most recently, she's, been the, she's the editor of Other Places, uh, an anthology on media arts in Canada. Uh, Deanna is joining us today from Montreal, where she's the assistant professor in the Department of Studio Arts at Concordia University. I had the good fortune to work alongside Deanna on the realization of her most recent solo exhibition, Black Drones in the Hive. It's a sprawling multi-room project in which items from KWAG, uh, the museum at which I work, our permanent collection, uh, historical publications, archives ranging from local to international, uh, all are woven together to create a narrative of migration, dispossession, power networks, hierarchies, of remembrance, all kind of centered in Ontario, Canada. As the project evolved, it became clear that many of the representations of Black livelihood that were easiest to locate in archives doubled as records of labor, of near erasure, or outright refusal. The relationship between the authorship of many of the exhibition's contents and W.E.B. Du Bois's notion of double consciousness was unavoidable at a certain point in the exhibition's evolution. And I know Deanna is likely to touch on um, that in the hour ahead, or at least give us a context for thinking um, about those thoughts uh, further. So today, this afternoon, our format is gonna be uh, largely illuminating Deanna and all her brilliance. So uh, she's gonna start us off with a, an introduction, introductory talk on her work. Um, after which we'll have a brief discussion and then there'll be time for questions at the end. So please feel free uh, to share your questions or thoughts in the Q&A or chat windows. I'll be checking in and, um, and sharing them with Deanna uh, towards the end of today. So please join me in welcoming Deanna Bowen. Gosh, Crystal. <clears throat> she always kind of makes me feel super, anyhow. <laughs> you are uh, super. <laughs> Thank you, love. Um, just for the sake of time, I've written a script for the slides I want to show you um, because I do want to have a conversation with Crystal and with you all in the audience. So I'm going to um, spare you from watching me read uh, for the next 15 minutes or so, um, and I'll come back and be happy to chat with you soon. So I'm a storyteller at heart, and my family has been the central theme of my work for the last 20 plus years. My grandmother's family, the Bowens, came to Canada from Pine Flat, uh, Alabama, uh, via Clearview, Oklahoma, formerly Indian Territory. And my grandfather's family, the Risbys, came to Canada from Trigg County, Kentucky, via Nicodemus, Kansas. Our two families are part of a community of four black colonies considered to be the northernmost in North America, situated in Northern Alberta. I use whatever means necessary to tell my family's story of enslavement in the US and emancipation in Canada. I'm interested in the day-to-day -day realities that made up what we have become. Um, I want to know how my family's minds and bodies have been impacted by the racism they've experienced. And I'm also keen to know why we are here, or rather 
I'm keen to illustrate the ways that racialized violence prompted our numerous migrations across the continent. The formal aspects of the work I create are always determined by the nature of the archival objects I discover. Most often text, sometimes photographs or videos, sometimes objects. The works are made in ways that help me tell aspects of my family's history, whether seen or unseen. I'll go back a second. There you go. I'm particularly concerned with making works that discourage fetishistic consumption of Black pain. And performance and archival projects, uh, reenactments have been an incredibly successful strategy of completing compelling mostly white audiences to grow beyond knee jerk denial of anti black racism in Canada. This work involves research into hate groups like the Ku Klux Klan in my 2012 and 13 exhibitions, the Paul Good Papers and Invisible Empires. And the unpleasant outcome of this work is that I can see the Klan and other hate groups everywhere. The works that I create about them are based on the objects and material I collect in my archival wanders. And I'm acutely aware of the pain that these groups uh, still inflict. So the work has always become, has also become a way of mapping sites of racial conflict and an offering of safety to communities and cities that I don't have a family connection with. I imagine my work to be a kind of queer black feminist interventionist publishing strategy. I conceptualize project that, projects that make use of gallery systems and public exhibitions as a means to disseminate counter narratives to white mainstream art cultures. I think about beauty and aesthetics as they relate to my efforts to make the things that I know desirable. And in my mind, these works are framed as institutional critique and part of this inv involves making work that obliges institutions and collectors to value formerly undesirable Black histories. My videos and interdisciplinary projects do the work of documenting my family's lineage and migration across and within broader historical narratives. I'm often in my works because it's an ethical and responsible place to create from. And I make this difficult and very necessary personal work more familiar and readily accessible to viewers because it is, an exceptionally, it is exceptionally demanding and there is no manual of best practices on how one should recover from intergenerational trauma. There's no predetermined path of my research and I make use of the creative opportunities, opportunities that I'm offered. So this means that my work could manifest as a 24 hour restaging of a Black Lives Matter protest during Nuit Blanche in 2017. Or it could also mean turning a gallery space into an eight week long live rehearsal video production installation piece all around the works of uh, evac excavates hidden black histories while also illustrating the previously unconceivable ways that my family would contribute to many histories. Speaking a bit more intimately, um, my work makes good use, so to speak, of the forensic gaze that comes from growing up in an underclass community comprised of God-fearing people, colorful entertainers, and shady hustlers. My work embraces the clash and the confusion of this mix of folks and the very curious yet consistent surveillance they endured over the many decades since our arrival in the 1910s. My research has helped reveal over a hundred years of my family's presence and hardship in Western Canada and the prairies. And so the work is also a proud testimony of our strength and endurance. So what I'm going to map out for you now are uh, a body of work that ultimately leads to the creation of uh, Black Drones in the Hive, which is the project that we want to talk about today. And everything really kind of revolves around this particular piece. It's uh, entitled the 1911 Anti-Creek Negro Petition. Uh, the extended title is on the slide, but it in short is a petition that was generated in response to the migration of African and African uh, Afro-Native people who were coming up from Indian territory. That's basically my family and our communities. And the petition was generated in Alberta by boards of trade who insisted that if the prime minister then, 
Prime Minister Laurier, if he did not intervene in stopping this flow of, of immigrants, that they would be obliged to resort to uh, lynch mob uh, groupings and uh, murderous, in fact, conflict. So what I'm interested in um, is the what we had discovered in installing it once uh, um, in 19, uh, sorry, 2013 in Invisible Empires as it was presented as anti-Black uh, evidence, so to speak. But it was re uh, restaged again and carry forward by a good friend of mine, Lisa, Lisa May uh, Myers, an Indigenous curator who was thinking through ideas around um, the document and the archive itself. And in that ex exhibition, I think it was read uh, more as evidence of anti-Indigenous uh, violence in the nation. Either which way, it revived the petition and we, in its installation, in the second time, we discovered the, the name of a person that was uh, known to the gallery, known to most people in Canadian art history. And his name was Barker Fairley, and he was a gentleman that was a central player in Canada's early 1920s onwards uh, cultural narrative, uh, its white nationalist narrative, and of course, more importantly, the significance, significance of uh, Canada's uh, group of seven painters, probably the biggest cultural import, export, my bad, uh, coming out of Canada. So by tracing uh, Barker Fairley into his various cultural and academic circles, I stumbled across uh, this gentleman, Carol Aikens in the center, and staged a piece about a horrifically um, racist red face play that he had written and staged at Hart House Theatre. Um, and it should be understood that Hart House Theatre is kind of, in many ways, uh, ground central for all of the Canadian cultural kind of ambitions and ideas around traditional arts uh, and relationship to nation building. So following Barker Fairley and then Carol Aikens opened the door to understand that really the ways in which nationhood was crafted and the, what the role that the arts was uh, played in that really was de determined through the social networks. People of similar classes and similar political ideologies who um, convened in the gentlemen clubs and thought very hard, schemed very deeply about how to make a white nation. Part of that exhibition involved creating an hour and a half uh, video uh, conversation with Lisa Myers, my friend Archip Chawis, who's uh, featured here in this slide, uh, Cheyenne Turions, John Hampton, and Peter uh, Moran, all very good friends of mine in Toronto. Uh, and we came together and spoke about the, the tendencies, we'll say, of white settlers to perform indigeneity. And then that became a larger discussion that I took abroad to the Berlin Biennale just this last year um, and made connections between this same proclivity towards in, uh, performing indigeneity with the German people uh, in Berlin, uh, particularly for the fact that I was trying to make my, back, my way back to Kitchener, which also used to go by the name of Berlin, and I'll unpack that in a second. But what also became clear in this body of work, uh, this wallpaper project that literally took the photo documentation of the art museum exhibition and used it as a template to reconceive historical documents that spoke to uh, various forms of empire and genocide. Uh, most uh, importantly, perhaps, is the Germans in Namibia and the uh, genocide of the Herero people. But at the same time, we also had Britain and their destruction of Zululand and, of course, their genocide of the Zulu, uh, Zulu people, and then further going further into South Africa, along with Cecil Rhodes and the uh, genocide that both the railway and the um, British Empire empire uh, brought to the landscape. Um, at the same time, eugenics is taking hold as is anthropometry and a whole other, other array of quote unquote scientific means to classify the human body, of course, uh, all in the service of slavery or um, forced labor amongst other things. Um, and so this constellation or many of the constellations in this exhibition pointed to uh, thoughts that kind of span across German, British and Canadian uh, landscapes, largely around the notion of the pure race uh, and genocide and the eradication, eros uh, the erasure of indigenous and black, black bodies globally. 
So the, I picked up the thread of the Berlin Biennale project uh, and then brought it to Kitchener-Waterloo. And so this is the first body of work that you'll see coming into the exhibition. And it is an enlargement of a postcard uh, that illustrates the death of Uncle Tom, deeply dramatic portrayal. And then on the other side, it is Thomas Nast's uh, emancipation full spread in Harper's Weekly. And what is most perhaps interesting to me here in this constellation is the ways in which this effectively kind of illustrates the death cycle uh, better to be understood as the only kind of possible cycle in which the black body could be represented. Uh, only its inter its body, the black body is introduced in its uh, um, advances to death only to be resurrected gloriously and then to die fighting for one struggle again, which brings you back to the death of Uncle Tom. The cycle is uh, endlessly repetitive. And so it's um, one of the vantage points that this project starts in. And I think that that too is speaking to, to Du Bois's ideas of double consciousness and this awareness, my awareness that there is a particular way in which the black body has been framed in the United States. And I mention that because again, this is my vantage point while black and I am American, I have been raised in a Canadian context and uh, deciphering, uh, making clear who I am within this context, within empire, um, always involves a kind of cr cross-border scrutiny to understand how I am read from local, under local regional kind of understandings of Blackness versus how I am uh, read and then alternate, alternately erased within uh, the British Empire. As you wake your, make your way into the main gallery, you're gonna also pass this gallery and Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery is a collecting institution. And so uh, many, in many, many ways, the pro this site is, this collection of images is a, a rebuke uh, in so much as these were all early group of seven foundational quote unquote Canadian painters with uh, a ser and all of these are landscapes that are absent of black and indigenous bodies. Um, that is a significant thing to think through uh, and how significant and central these landscapes are, its landscape paintings are in the depiction of Canada, the new nation, um, void of, of problematic pesty blacks and indigenous peoples. Um, but how I turn it on its back is by installing a contemporary work or co two contemporary works that um, basically call into question and, and make, make a better picture, present a better picture of who resided on the landscape. Um, the image on the left, uh, my left, is a blue is the reproduction of an oral history provided by Sophia Pooley and one other by John Francis in um, Refugee, uh, the Refugee or a North Side View of Slavery. Um, and that is, oh my goodness, I'm forgetting his name, but um, uh, Benjamin Drew. Benjamin uh, Drew. And thank you, love. <laughs> And Sophia Pooley tells a very interesting story about uh, her theft um, in the Deep South and having been brought to in, um, indigenous territories uh, where Joseph Brandt, Mohawk Chief Joseph Brandt was in the United States. And she tells the story of how she was bought by Joseph Brandt and then brought to Canada along with 40 other slaves and they were all camped on uh, Mohawk territory just down the way from Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery. So she tells the story of her uh, experiences as a slave, but it is, I think, really interesting in my mind because it speaks to her presence, the very real uh, presence of her body on this landscape, as are all the oral histories that Benjamin Drew published in that text. Um, that image sits uh, in relationship to uh, an eagle song that was performed by my good friend Archer Pachawis. And so the only way that you can actually hear that performance, that, that, that song, is if you are in close attendance, uh, the audience of one in front of Sophia Pooley's testimony disregarding the landscapes uh, that would undoubtedly be behind you. So the formal entry into this large exhibition begins here with the, the vacant pedestal of uh, re, uh, duplicate of uh, a pedestal that sits in Victoria Park um, in Kitchener-Waterloo. Um, and it's a, a life-size replica um, crystal 
Can you remind me? Um, yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. <laughs> remind you of of. Mind you, <laughs> the the <laughs> subject, the the original <laughs> subject of the no of the monument. I, I, it's too far gone. Never mind. Yeah. It's okay. It's uh it's um Wilhelm the first. No, and, I've, no, I've got that. I wasn't thinking about that. Okay. I apologize. Okay. I'm um, out. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> but the short of it is, is when you come into this exhibition, you're going to be encountered with this life-size replica of the pedestal that used to hold the bust of uh, Kaiser Wilhelm the um, first. Whoops, wrong way. Um, and as you go into the space, really what we're thinking through, what I'm thinking through as it relates to my family is this notion of the black drone, which itself is a phrase that's taken from the poor house, the Waterloo House of Industry and Refuge, where a number of the um, fugitive slaves that came across the border through the Underground Railway, uh, under, Underground Railroad, my apologies, uh, where they had lived their final years, uh, where they were uh, buried behind, and in uh, search of those records came to understand that there was a terminology that was applied for formerly, you know, human labor, uh, former slaves, um, and the terminology is that they, the black drone, a perfect black drone, that notion of a, a black body that is only good for breeding and labor. Um, and in that interrogation, uh, I ultimately came to understand um, what the everyday black person, uh, how they are understood in contemporary life in that time. And so this constellation of images is one speaking to the very bleak, admittedly, cycle that is obliged to black people, but it also is an opportunity for me to insert my family in there. My grandfather and my great great grandmother are situated in this constellation of images because they would have been in a landscape very much like this. But moving more broadly, the show picks up on a lot of the threads that came out of the Berlin project, most importantly being eugenics um, and population control and uh, creation of the ideal white race. Uh, and of course, with anthropometry comes along uh, the Bertillon uh, system, a way of, of uh, categorizing criminals, which we would understand as being the precursor, of, of course, to the modern day mugshot. Um, so all of these things are tucked within this uh, first, so, so to speak, chapter. Um, and it speaks to the reality of this region being a very central place uh, of, of eugenic study um, and actual eugenics itself. Um, this is a constellation that speaks to the history of Kitchener when it was known as Berlin prior to 1916. And in this constellation, it does in fact speak to black presence that goes back to the early 1850s. Um, uh, it also speaks to the role of uh, black labor, uh, serious anti-German sensibilities, um, uh, evidence of early industrialized la industrial labor, uh, and of course, the founder of A.R. Uh, Kaufman of the local rubber factory and major supplier, uh, an industrial player, is also um, one of the biggest uh, campaigners for quote unquote planned parenthood or, or modern day population control. But really what we're effectively speaking to is the decrease or the eradication of surplus uh, human labor deemed um, dull or fetal minded. Um, what else do we have in here? We have evidence also of the riot that led to the renaming of uh, Berlin. Um, again, a site that was founded by uh, Pennsylvania Dutch that came across in the early 1800s, but come the advent of the First World War, uh, anti-German sentiment was a very real thing in this neck of the region. And uh, again, speaking to the kind of global enterprise of um, uh, global imperial plunder. Um, Berlin is ultimately renamed after warlord uh, Kitchener, uh, responsible for the invasion and annexation of not only uh, South Africa, but a number of other uh, nations, including India, um, Afghanistan, the Sudan, uh, South Africa again, and then other regions uh, facing into uh, um, uh, Asia. 
So the very fact that this town would be named after a warlord uh, with this kind of a reputation perhaps speaks to the hostility and the mindset of Canada in its infancy. The exhibition also, as Crystal had pointed out at the beginning of our conversation, speaks to the Haldeman tract, uh, Joseph Brandt, Brandt and his family, his lineage, and of course also the Johnson family, uh, which itself uh, is uh, William Johnson and Molly Brandt, uh, uh, an interracial relationship um, that uh, unfortunately is also connected um, as uh, to the superintendent of Indian Affairs, Molly Brandt uh, married William Johnson, who himself was superintendent of Indian Affairs. And it strikes a very curious kind of questioning about the complicitness of indigenous and white settlers in this region, particularly as it relates to the black body. This region also, uh, in again, thinking through those idyllic romantic landscapes, this region is also a site where there has been an enormous loss of bodies enormous bloodshed through numerous wars ranging from the American Revolution, uh, War of 1812, uh, Civil War, um, what else have we got, the Boer Wars, also First World War, Second World War, all of that coming, the, lot, the, the, mo the bulk of the stock, the people that were on the front lines were young men coming from this region. Uh, as well as uh, other complementary troops that weren't initially wanted. My great uncle, or sorry, my bad, uh, second cousin, second removed, <laughs> um, was actually one of the few black soldiers that enlisted in the number two construction battalion, which was the only black battalion during the First World War. Um, so it speaks to the singularity and the, and the hostility of against blackness in that time frame, but also against indigenous soldiers as well. And so this cluster involves the documentation of a variety of, of military troops that come from this area, as well as Black Americans, uh, and also Indigenous soldiers, uh, and the appeals by Mohawk mothers uh, writing a, a letter to the federal government imploring them to release their children. They are not, pro, not obliged to fight this white man's war. Also, of course, slavery, speaking to the region and the history that uh, is inherently about this ne neck of the woods as well, obviously being part of the Underground Railroad and the very reasoning behind the migration of those black bodies across the border has everything to do, of course, with slavery itself. So that needed to be spoken to here. And then also, again, speaking of the Underground Railroad, this is a, a constellation of images that speaks to this neck of the woods, this region actually being a site of conflict and resistance. Most people don't know that Uncle Tom's Cabin actually exists and resides in Ontario and Dresden, Ontario. Most people also don't know that John, um, John Brown planned uh, the attack on Harper's Ferry here in Chatham as well. So Canada as an abolitionist site was an important thing to put forward. And even though Britain is said to have abolished uh, slavery in 1833, their um, invasion and annexation of African nations and other racialized nations um, uh, really kind of speaks to the, to the lie behind that proclamation. Slavery is very much a part of this landscape, as is the, the um, gestures toward freedom. And uh, a number of uh, Black newspapers come out of this neck of the woods as well that speaks to the underground uh, network and also the clarity and intelligence of the folks that were in, in this neck of the woods. Um, I wanna kind of close this. I think I'm happily kind of meeting my time limit, but I wanna to speak to this final gesture that we're after having gone through both of these rooms and the images in the front of the lobby and all of this hardship and cruelty. Um, all of this brought together and one can't help but think of and, uh, the need to, the deep desire to honor the dead, those who have passed, my family and others who, still, regardless of all of the gross racism and inequity of the time frame, still found a way to find joy, um, much like this jubilation, ju jubilee parade on the left. And then, of course, as far as a matter of paying respects, uh, my good friend um, Charles Ellison, I met here in Montreal just weeks before I started my position. 
uh, and he's a dear friend of mine who teaches in the Montreal in the uh, music program, and he performs a beautiful uh, repeating rendition of taps that signals uh, my respect, our respect uh, throughout the gallery on repeat all throughout the day. And it is uh, the appropriate soundtrack to kind of take in this constellation of images. Um, and of course, on the opposite wall is that petition again that, in, that serves in this instance as evidence of white terrorism. So it seems uh, important to uh, give thanks in this way, as dark as the exhibition is, can be, depending on who you are as an audience member. Um, it's such an incredibly important exhibition to come together, and I couldn't possibly have done it without Crystal Mowry, who is just as dogged in the archive as I am, and uh, just as steely-nerved, even though we both get, the, get anxious before a talk. But really, um, both of us have, uh, I think came together to put to put together a very important show that speaks back to uh, images that white people have made of us. Uh, and in that, again, we'll talk about double consciousness as it relates to not only uh, white America, but also uh, white British uh, empire. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Deanna. Can we see you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, you know, no matter how you rehearse something, the stumbles come out of your, the marbles come into the mouth. And yeah, I hope you all understood what I was saying. I think so. Um, yeah. You know, it's funny. We've been living with this show for how long now? Oh my gosh, six months, more than six months, oh, right? Morning. Because the pandemic has, has uh, of course, corrupted all ability to plan and to um, maintain schedules. And I'm actually quite fine with living with the show longer, as difficult as it can be at, at times. And, you know, um, when I was thinking about W.E.B. Du Bois, um, the, the introduction of the notion of, of uh, double consciousness, first published in, in The Atlantic and then later on in, in The Souls of, of Black Folk, um, there's this really critical, like super po potent um, mention of a single sentence that often comes back to me um, when I am spending time in the show. And that question is, how does it feel to be a problem? And this is, <laughs> you know, it's a question that I think, I think black folks encounter often and, you know, racialized folks in general probably have have thought about it um, often. And I've been thinking about it in relation to the exhibition. Every time I'm in there, I think about what it's like to be a problem. And, you know, my thinking, weirdly enough, has shifted in being in that show to think about um, white supremacy as the problem. So what does it feel like to be that problem? And when I'm in that exhibition, as horrifying as it is to say this, it must feel pretty good because we're, <laughs> because you're looking you're looking at the evidence of this, right? Like to see to be that problem does not feel too bad. I mean, when I think in particular of the Bill Berlin constellation, and I guess I'll point that one out because that's closest to me, that's closest to you know the the um, context in which I'm working. Um, there's one piece that I swear an image it breaks my heart every time, and it's that. Um, it's, uh, it's the reproduction of the, um, the directory listing of laborers in the community. Mm -hmm. you know this, right? It's a very innocuous image, I think, to most folks, right? Like, you'll see this list of various names of people uh, and their specialization or their trade. Um, and it's a, a reproduction of an image that would have been in a local um, directory so that, you know, if you needed, um, if you needed uh, a notary or you needed um, a barber or something, mm -hmm. you would know where to go. And whenever I look through that list, I see all of these images, or all of these names that are echoed in our street names throughout the community. They're echoed in business names. You know, there's they're uh, foundational to the Rotary, to charities all over town. And nestled in there is the name of Levi Carroll, an otherwise forgotten man, right? He was a formerly enslaved man. 
who uh, who lived out the remainder of his life in a decommissioned schoolhouse, the first schoolhouse in the region, um, and uh, eventually could not afford to sustain himself and and lived out the remainder of his days in the, the uh, Waterloo House of County, yeah. Waterloo County House of Industry and Refuge. And so I see him in that list and I think, my goodness, it's so, there's such a discrepancy between the modes of remembrance that we engage in collectively. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, you know, if I could turn it back to you on being a problem, <laughs> not to say that you are a problem, but you know, how, how do that. you find how do you find ways to think through the problem in institutional spaces that are probably not ready to be thinking of themselves as part of the problem? Uh, are you asking me, do I care? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think I know the answer to that question. <laughs> I'm not sure what you're asking me. Do I yeah. feel fine about it? I feel fine about it. I feel- Are there problems that are more, in some problems that are more interesting than others when you go into institutions? And I know this because I, I ask you this because I know that you are such a voracious researcher. And even when we were working on this project and we were finding things all the time and there were only so many, uh, there were only so many directions we could go in. And I swear if we had a year, to keep adding to the show, it would just keep getting bigger and bigger, right? But that's why I have other shows, right? And yes. That, and that's, <laughs> that's the purpose. I mean, part of it is really about, it's about that reality of digging so deep that you've got so much information. Part of it is just about getting it out of the head so that you can kind of keep moving forward, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. They're unfinished conversations at the back of the mind, right? So the best way to be able to kind of move forward for my own well-being is to make a show about it and move through it right mm -hmm. um how do i feel about how do i feel about being the problem um i haven't always enjoyed this um this responsibility at all i will say that for sure for sure but um oh maybe the last five years or so it's just become um bigger than me and so i wouldn't i couldn't imagine stop uh, that i would stop doing this because there it's just now so much more about other things and other peoples and other communities and other justices and other, you know, again, the idea that my little black family, nobody else can call them that, but my, my little black family, that it could be the key to undoing an entire nation's cultural narrative is super fantastic. And there, it is addictive in and of itself. It's necessary. Because as you say, most institutions here are certainly not ready to let go of, you know, the cash cow that is the group of seven. Um, and they're not ready for a more complex discussion of Canadian history. It's infinitely easier to stay on the shallow end and point at other people, you know. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that, I don't think that we're quite there as far as maturity goes to be able to fully embrace it all. I, you know, I, I've been here all of five minutes and, you know, the narrative has been constructed over quite some time. And so if at the most basic level, if what I'm doing right now opens up some doors for future research, I, you know, I have a good ego. I would like to think I could kill it all in my lifetime, but what if I can't, right? And so leaving behind, um, enough or uh, poking enough holes in the narrative that would open the door for subsequent research is kind of all that really matters and so um but that you know why it doesn't affect me being the problem is because i'm not thinking about them really i'm thinking about the black people that i'm working with i'm thinking about the black communities that have been unseen i'm thinking about other descendants of other black towns and their desire to have their history acknowledged. I'm thinking about black students, black pedagogy, black art history, black presence in Canada. That's what I'm thinking about. And I don't really have time to stress about whether or not I'm a problem so much at this stage. You know, it's like I don't have time for that drama. Um, that is not, I have not always had that position, but I have it right now and I'm making very good use of it. And that's what you're supposed to do mm -hmm. when you get that kind of power is you open the door and you lift people up. And so that's what I'm doing. Um, and mm -hmm. I'll do that just by nature of the, the extraordinary force 
of the Canadian uh, mythology around blackness, just the, the thickness of that. Um, if I can crack it open, and, and, you know, I mean, it's something also about being the first one to do that, not to say that I'm like super special in that regard, there have been people before me, but I have a particular platform right now. And in this regard, I feel like, um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not thinking about white, I'm not thinking about white people who imagine me as a problem. I'm thinking about my ancestors. I'm thinking about next generation mm -hmm. I'm thinking about right now, you know, yeah. for black folks. And yeah. indigenous folks and Asian folks and South Asian. And I'm, I'm all about breaking this open. This place is not that place that Justin Trudeau says we are because he's a shut my mouth. Anyhow, so <laughs> all that to say that there's a, that, you know, that that thing is so darn thick. Um, it's going to take a, a generations of people like yeah. me. And so they just need to be built, yeah. fostered. Well, you know, Dubois wrote those words what, over a hundred years ago, like a hundred and what was it? 125 years ago, maybe, maybe more, oh, no more than that, 150 years ago. Though the question is still, I think it's still um, vital for some folks and vital in the sense that it, it, it can be internalized. Mm. It can feel real. Um, and, you know, Dubois is, uh, despite, you know, feeling or knowing that his uh, the arc of his his contributions to critical thought around um, around blackness overlap with Confederation in the sense mm -hmm. of Confederation of Canada, like that timeline is the same, mm -hmm. similar to you know the migration of your family, like it's not mm -hmm. that far off that timeline. Um, it's really interesting to me too that you know he was um, he was uh, a visionary when it came to publishing too. And you had mentioned one part, I love when you reference your practice as, uh, as a kind of uh, black queer feminist publishing and probably so many other things kind yeah. of effort, right? Because publishing is one way that we can exercise agency and autonomy, right? Absolutely. Uh, and Marianne, Marianne Shad knew that and yeah. W. The Dubois knew that with the crisis. I mean, Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, to a certain extent, the use of their Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know, I think um, it's, and that is something like when you create your own voice, or you publish on your own voice, you're not beholden necessarily to the institution or the state. Right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter if you criticize Justin Trudeau because Canada Council isn't necessarily funding all of those things. <laughs> and they're an arm's length agency yeah. too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> but but I mean that publishing in the the kind of I, I wanna gonna get you back into talking a little bit about the published word because so much of um, the imagery that's in our show and, and and appeared in other shows are reproductions of publications, right? How can you talk a little bit about your time in the archives and how how you navigate uh, what may feel like an overwhelming resource of possibilities. But it doesn't start there. It actually happens. It, start it, it starts in the absence of resources, actually. And then from there, um, because again, the black body doesn't exist here, right? So, so to speak. Um, and uh, I would say that the archive, Canadian archive system, they're, they're, we're just not there, right? We're just not there. Or if we are, we're buried and lost or miscategorized or uh, cataloged under derogatory terminology or, you know, and, and then British politeness, well, it's not really politeness, but whatever. And all of that stuff and the way that it informs the way that the black body has been or has not been taken up here, right? I mean, what there is an excess of, even here in Canada, is an extraordinary amount of information about Black American culture. Um, and I, I've been thinking, I was thinking about this all morning about being the, uh, and, I'm, and I'm thankful for the question about, I just have to backtrack a second, about this idea of being trouble, because I think part of the thing that folks may or may not understand about Blackness here is that I was just thinking about this this morning about how the body, the black bodies that are largely not recognized in the Canadian canon of Canadian archive are the, are the bodies of former American slaves, for the most part, right? 
And then beyond that, it's the descendants of those same Black folks, right? It's not the same for the Caribbean community because the Caribbean community is of itself part of the British Commonwealth, right? Through its annexation. So it was just, it was just occurring to me and thinking about nation building, uh, nationhood, national, national responsibilities, and the fact that the American Revolution plays a big part in why we are actively erased. Britain literally looked at what was happening during the Civil War, chose not to necessarily interfere too, too much, but really imagined the uh, flow of uh, former, Amer former American slaves as really the excess of the new nation of America, right? So this resistance to the black body, the generations of people like you and I who are, are born of here or are raised here, we are the byproduct of a new nation and Britain turned its back on it because it's not their problem. These black bodies are America's problem. They'll claim British body or black uh, Caribbean bodies ish. Uh, and this is by no means to say that there isn't anti-Black racism against Caribbean people or other Black bodies in the em in empire, but except I'm just trying to tease out the distinctiveness of mm -hmm. this population of Black people that I'm trying to trace, right? And the cracks that they fall in. So in a uh, British, uh, an imperialist um, archive, we are not their problem, therefore not cataloged. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And at the same time, because we've crossed the border, we don't fit into the American archive of, you know, uh, the vast archive that is uh, the existing kind of uh, slave history that uh, makes up many American institutions, right? We are of neither and, and add into it indigeneity. Um, and it would really just deeply fall in between the cracks of various policies between nations. And I mean that both indigenous and otherwise, right? I'm making sense to you about being the problem. Um, so yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that, about what is the problem, right? And so it, it thinks, it helps me to think through why Black American culture is pushed on a body like mine who's doing political work that bridges that, the two, the two nations, right? And how the encouragement is to go back to the United States. Is that, am I making sense to you? Yeah. yeah. So I'm fascinated about that. So sorry, just to kind of go there, but all that <laughs> to say that that informs this question about, you know, the, the project didn't start in an excess of material. The project start, started out of uh, dearth. It, 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 it came out of the gross absence of material and then being obliged to look at American content and then being obliged to look even deeper into Brit British content because, I mean, I we, I mean, you and I are here. We know we are here. There are oral histories that speak to our presence for a hundred years, right? So you know what I mean? So we had to have been documented somewhere, right? And so that's when I find myself going through like usually the back door of some other archive that's completely not related or again, miscategorized or whatever. And then finding um, either the right person um, more often than not, the right person who knows where that repository of, of hidden Black people are. Um, and then that's where the things open up. Um, so um, for this ex exhibition as an example, um, bear in mind that the exhibition comes into being over COVID lockdown, right? So mm -hmm. we're talking about public archives, and I mean, I mean eBay, I mean our internet archive, I mean library, you know, all of that stuff. All of these publicly accessible, copyright cleared um, images are out there in the world. There is a plethora of white images, white authored images of Black people. I mean, I guess, and that's, but again, that largely kind of plays on the American side of the coin. So that's where a lot of this material is coming from, right? Mm -hmm. um, the problem with that is how do you find the Canadian connections or the connections to empire and all of that stuff, right? Um, so I think it was the absence of images, the absence of data that ultimately turned into a process that reclaimed white authored images in a way that I could bring them, present them back in a way that it still doesn't solve the job of being able to present Black Canadian people that were here a hundred years ago, but it does. It, it does a lot. It does allow me the opportunity to illustrate the system and the people that did see these people, 
um, you know, I'm not going to get the representation. And I guess there's, there's the other blessing about working from this site is I'm not working against, uh, I am working against the histories, many histories of African American representation by white people, but at the same time, not their, their lack of representation of the Black Canadian body is a gift in a way because I'm unseen and that helps my research um, endlessly because nobody knows what I'm even talking about, right? But not having the image of the Black body has provided this opportunity to flip the gaze, again, largely out of absence, uh, to be able to flip the gaze and put it back to um, show white people, again, Canada, predominantly white audiences, show white people themselves um, and then make and reckon with that. I guess that's the gift of, of the absence of. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah. yeah, and I think uh, you and I have talked in the past about the role that photography has played in, in um, kind of thinking through uh thinking through the truth in certain images or the, the perceived truth in certain images and also um you know the difficulty in representing the black body uh, the traumatized black body using photographic means and there's one image in the show in particular that's the um uh whipped gordon yep. image it's a widely circulated historical image for those of you who haven't seen it it's um it's a, an image of a man from behind, um, and his back is is just um, lacerated, lacerated uh, through countless uh, lashings and whippings. And this was thought to be an image that galvanized people, right, through publication again, like through the reproduction in uh, a mass circulated. Um, uh, I think it was it the I can't remember if it was Harper's or if it was. The Atlantic, but that that was um, that seeing the the landscape on that man's back, the the geography of that trauma, in a sense, that that was sufficient to sorta sufficient <laughs> to galvanize people to see the cruelty and and the inhumanity and in, um, in but slavery, that's, that's but not that's enough, that's not enough, truly, yeah. right? Yeah. But you know, there are some images, and I guess I mentioned that image because um, because you and I have also talked about you know the fact that there are some images that are, are kind of close for me as a curator to, or difficult for me as a curator to be near in yeah. that space. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I, it's not that I don't want to speak to them, but to be in proximity to them, just there's a, an energy or charge right. that can be difficult to navigate, right? So how do you know, how, how do you work with those images? And um, when do you choose, when is the right time to use images like that as part of um, a, a greater effort? Mm -hmm. um, what Peter also is a postcard of so, like, so broadly disseminated, um, what is not often disseminated is the, the, the uh, inscription on the back of that postcard mm -hmm. and what it was meant to, the purpose it was meant to serve. It was actually documentation um, and it was a field report about the status of um, the slaves in that region. So um, how do I feel? When is it time? Um, I wouldn't have put that image in this constellation of over a hundred or so images if it wasn't contextualized with a whole bunch of other things, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and even if it is in this exhibition, it's been inverted in a way that has rendered it, um, uh, well, it's reversed it. There's a really lovely way that uh, the reversal of a positive, sometimes uh, it, it is quite protective, so to speak. Um, the gaze is not as clear. The, the, everything kind of is inverted in a really wonderful way that I think, um, provide some refuge at the very least. It is not a perfect rendition. And so um, it is one of probably five images in the show that I made the decision to include that were hard images, mm -hmm. but they were images that I could, again, contextualize in a way that made them less gratuitous. And certainly it, um, I was hoping that I was avoiding pain porn in that regard. Yes, yeah. Um, but, you know, in another kind of, I'm not, 
I haven't had the opportunity to see how people respond to the show in the same way that you have because yeah. we've been locked down. So I actually don't know where people go with this, right? Mm -hmm. But I would say what the show does, one, it requires so much of your time to kind of make it through, to get through it and actually read it and you know get the messages that come to you. Um, it's not a, a quick show, right? But I'm curious about whether or not, um, like I, I feel like the space that I've created is an inversion of things in so much as the expectation as a black artist in Canada is to produce the things that make white people weep and feel all kinds of deep things and all that kind of stuff. And it requires like, you know, the selling of your, of your soul, so to speak. Um, and this is not that, I mean, this is painful, but I think it, uh, there is enough, um, rebuttal in the project that I feel like even those few moments of, of violence and vulnerability are still couched within a, a bigger protective entity. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that that image of what uh, Gordon or what Peter um, is juxtaposed with uh, the, the mass produced or, or mass circulated um, diagram of the Brooks slave ship. Mm -hmm. the, how all of mm -hmm. the interior of that ship was partitioned to maximize um, the, the cargo. cargo. Right? Yeah. And seeing that image surrounded by these various other images that speak to trade, because there's the, the market, the, the slave market image as well, um, the image of the, the ship, which speaks to uh, compartmentalization, organization, all of that order mm -hmm. that... Um, that the colony likes and the you know, advertisement for the shackles and all, yeah. yeah all of that it's kind of surrounded by these images that that uh that do not do not contain any of that embodiment but still speak to to some horror right but, it all, but yeah it speaks to white mm -hmm. horror it's the white terror like again like another way you can say that all of these images are speaking to white terrorism in one way or another right mm -hmm. um and so I guess in another way, when coming back to this question about those particularly sensitive images, I feel I felt OK about including them because I know that this exhibition serves a kind of a, it, it, it um, I don't know if this is the right way to say this, but it offers a it's it's vengeance. It's a vengeance. And so mm -hmm. um, I think that it appropriately puts the pain where it needs to be. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Because it's not on those bodies. It, it is something, and this brings me back to the thought about what the space looks like when an audience is there, because I imagine that they are affected, right? And I mean that, you know, heavy mm -hmm. heart affected, right? But that is not what it was when I started making, which was that I was coming away heavy hearted and affected and and consumed by an audience that, you know, paid good money or, or whatever, you know what I mean? That kind of thought process of coming to an exhibition and expecting a show, expecting to be entertained. And then I go home feeling like I've been just like mauled to death, mm -hmm. right? So the whole ambition of flipping this, uh, literally kind of the mind's eye, the double consciousness of, us, of this all renders but again, it puts the pain where it needs to be, which in a Canadian context is more often than not a white audience member. And that's, I think, where the work begins. I think that's where the shifts can begin. That's when a collective consciousness can be moved. Um, yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think, um, you know, the image of Whip Gordon, which Whip Peter, the problem with that image is, is just how sensational it is and how fetishistic it is, right? And I think when you have an opportunity to fill a room with all of the evidence, it's no longer a gratu gratuitous one-off. It's just a full and thorough uh, dossier of evidence that speaks to the very real, sustained, long-term, horrific, whatever which way you want to call it, just centuries of white terrorism right that's heavy and that and i would hope that people come out of there feeling that weight because that again is what makes things move mm -hmm. so that's kind of how i feel about 
big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> For what it's worth, I did not set out this today, this afternoon, to um, make you think about being trouble. Oh no, you don't I, know. I mean, if we were to if we were to conjure John Lewis, right? Like we want to be a certain kind <laughs> to of be trouble, good right? trouble. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I uh, does anyone have any questions out there? I'm keeping my eye on Q and A. I don't see any uh, anything coming through yet, but we are um, supposed to be wrapping very soon. Um, even though that's a I know a hard thing for us to do because we could probably be talking all day. But um, I want maybe um, just to give folks a chance to uh, add a question or two. I I would love to know. Um, I would love to know how you're thinking, how this project may be shaping or leading to other projects. I know you're not going to get into details right now, but were there certain but I realizations? Wanna. I know you want to, but were there certain realizations or, um, uh, yeah, certain realizations that came out of this project that that you know are are, are going to birth to you and and have a, a footing in future projects. Um, I'm currently tracing the social elite that comes out of Kitchener Waterloo and tracing them going into Ottawa and Montreal. Um, I'm looking at the founding years of the National Gallery and its connections to Queen Victoria. Um, I'm uh, tracing the creation of the Canadian National Railway in relationship to Cecil Rhodes' creation of the Transnational Railway in South Africa and the American Transnational uh, uh, Railway that was constructed. All of those things con uh, contr contribute to the genocide of Indigenous peoples, right? So thinking about those things. Um, what else am I looking at? I'm looking at the founding, I'm going a little bit beyond the group of seven and now going after Homer Watson and his and his generation. Um, the, the real deal uh, first, uh, first painters, first Canadian painters, um, looking at the first exhibition at the National Gallery, looking at the creation of that and the Ontario Art Gallery and all these other kind of regional institutions and how they're all led up by the same people right, basically, and it's the same, it's just an extension of the social network that comes out of uh, the Arts and Letters Club, the Heliconian Club, all of these fancy pants uh, membership clubs. Those, that's where, um, that's where I'm going. I'm just continuing to follow the lead. It's endless, really. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also looking at global, Britain's global, ex uh, it's, I don't even know what the word is to say, you know, their annexation, it's, it, they went around and took over countries. So I'm interested mm -hmm. in, in that. I'm interested in how Britain's uh, participation or, or initiation in the opium wars in China, um, uh, Britain's involvement, the, the colonization of India, which of course we think about Mahatma Gandhi as like this kind of, you know, mythological figure, but he is just as much, I mean, he's very much of this time frame, right? And thinking about all of that, thinking about South Africa and its apartheid system and its relationship to the past system here. Um, really, I mean, in many ways, I'm thinking a lot about how uh, empire imagined that the annex annexation of Canada was so successful that many of the strategies that they used here, they applied in other places like South Africa, like mm -hmm. in India, like in Afghanistan. These are Canada, and I suppose most people don't know this, but we are the template for how to take over a nation. Um, and the success of taking over, quote unquote, annexing Canada is something that I'm, I'm intrigued for because it also when we talk about this discussion around Canada multiculturalism, whatever you want to call it, the racialized bodies that come into the nation in the same time frame, besides my family, Indian people, uh, South Asian people coming in uh, through the Kamagata Maru, the head Asian head tax, all of this stuff also speaks to the expulsion of, of racialized bodies from countries that Britain plundered. And so that's what I'm looking at right now. That'll play out in a handful of shows in the next couple of years, but it all is—it's all part and parcel of the same narrative in 
I guess I get a little bit frustrated about it. The, the one thing that I don't like about being trouble is I get a little frustrated because I think that this is the work that institutions should be doing. This is what curators should be doing. Um, yeah. And so sometimes I get a little, I'm very thankful for the traffic, so to speak, but I'm also a little bit cranky for the fact that, you know, um, there needs to be an, a, a, a national or even, I'd be happy with provincial, but a curatorial kind of commitment to creating new art history and new research because that should happen. And so mm -hmm. I'm happy to be doing it. I'm happy it perhaps passes on some knowledge and other ways of thinking through things, but I'm also just like, you know, y'all get paid, <laughs> you know, um, we should be, this is, isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? It's not just all about, you know, protecting the canon. Isn't it also about generating new histories? Oh, that's such a provocative uh, uh, question. Um, so for part two, what we should do <laughs> is talk about uh, donor relations <laughs> and the um, protection of wealth in yeah. so many institutions, which, which I mean, I don't think I'm alone in saying that we know that plays a, a great, a great role in the silence within yeah. certain institutions, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, yeah, more on that next time. Uh, Deanna, thank you so much. As always, it's such a pleasure to um, to chat with you. And I, you, you all who didn't ask your questions, you lost out. Uh, <laughs> you know where to find. You know where to find her. She's everywhere. Um, and thank you so much for your time again. Our show, Black Drones in the Hive, is uh, is momentarily paused while the province is in lockdown. But our hope is that we'll open up again for at least one more week, if not a weekend. Um, so folks can see it before it closes. Yes, um, yes. So thank you, my dear. And everyone have a good afternoon. Go yeah. think big thoughts and change the world. And hopefully we'll see you all another yeah. time. Happy Thanks. Mother's Day. <laughs>